So in 2017, uh, Kevin's wings or fins perhaps expanded to include me. Uh, I'm Julia McGuire. I uh, teach the introductory bio for 100 and 200, and I coordinate the uh, pedagogy, the teaching and learning portion of the labs. And I have been so very fortunate to work with Kevin over these few short years, and um, I am so very grateful for your uh, humor, your mentorship, and fun discussions of all things Maine. So, Kevin graduated from the University of Delaware in 1978 with a BS degree with distinction in entomology. He was the first college attendee or graduate in his entire extended family, and his folks were very proud when, upon graduation, he got a great job at the DuPont Company. His parents' pride quickly turned to concern when he quit that job seven months later and moved back into their house. <laughs> he just couldn't be a cooperative guy. The next year, Kevin got married and enrolled in graduate school at the University of New Hampshire. He graduated from UNH in 1982 with an MS in entomology, then headed out west to become a research associate at Washington State University. Kevin worked as an extension entomologist at Cornell University in 1985 and did his first college teaching as an adjunct instructor at the Community College of the Finger Lakes during that same year. During the Washington State Cornell years, Kevin and his wife Cheryl had three children before they really figured out what was causing it. <laughs> and Kevin has been teaching full time at UMaine since January 1986. Um, it is my distinct privilege to introduce Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I asked, I asked Julia purposely to uh, introduce me because during the, the two and a half years she's been here, she's been a tremendous help to me because, and I'm gonna talk a lot about history over the next hour or whatever, so she arrived at a time when Ryan just got done, Mary was retiring, Karen and Robert had different jobs, so that left me and Farad, and I then went half time and Farad became the director of the school. So that left a lot of, of work on Julia's shoulders while, <laughs> while being pregnant and, you know, supposedly on maternity leave. So, like, I don't really know how you did that. But I personally, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all the things you did for me. So. I couldn't have done it without you. Okay, so let's see how I do here. That's the slide I showed in class the first day all the time, by the way. <laughs> so just a word on that slide loop first that, that I was running before you all before you all got here. It turned into a bigger hodgepodge than I was expecting, but for the most part, all those funny pictures are things I would always show before class. Um, I'd show a lot of these, like, pictures with me with hair, which is always, like, entertaining. <laughs> the, there'll be, like, a Red Sox component to this thing, so those will make sense. So, whatever. Like, hopefully, um, you'll get the meaning of that as we go along. First, like, I'm flattered by the turnout, like so many, like, People from around campus, you know, that I've worked with for so long came to listen and support me. I really appreciate that. And many, like, friends and family, you know, it's, it's, you, I'm to that age when I don't even see them. Where's my kids? Are they still here? Or they <laughs> <laughs> like, when your kids start showing up for things, like, it, you know, it's like, am I on life support? I don't know. But anyway. And I mean, I've been just uptight about this, you know, but I'm getting like very, very little love. Like Amy, I told her the other night, like I am literally gonna be nervous as shit at this seminar. And she's like, just wear brown pants. <laughs> I'm like, you gotta give me more than that. 
I really, I did, I did think through my wardrobe a little bit. Like I, I, I almost wore brown pants. I almost wore a tie. And then, like, I won't quiz people because we, we got, he, to, he told you, like, the beer starts and you're going to be all looking at your watch, so all right, I'll go quick. <laughs> but I also did a lot of Hawaiian, you know, I, I almost went Hawaiian, <laughs> but I just decided, you know, I'll just go with the, uh, with the regular stuff. So anyway, um, like I said, I will, you know, Julia was talking about working together and sharing information. So I think it's a two-way thing. There's knowledge, like technical knowledge, and then there's tradition. Like if you've been here 30 years, there's been a lot of stuff that's gone down that like I know, but, and I want other people who are new and starting to know as well. So I'll, I'll share some of that stuff as, as well today. When I got here, Betty Cook, Mary Major and a bunch of other people were really instrumental in, in helping me when I was a young whippersnapper just starting. And so much history of me and the department has happened in this room that um, I think I'll just start there. Like to most of you, this just feels like a very sterile college lecture hall with like uncomfortable seats and bad acoustics, <laughs> right? But I mean, to us, it's, it's just so much more. So when I was young, when I was like Julia's age, just starting, like these were the people who gave seminars here. You know, Malcolm, Dusty, John Dearborn, Irv, you know, Ringo, Bruce Seidel. It was different though. Like seminars now, they just seem so like polite, right? And, and under control. Like where's Kelly? Kelly, do you, I mean, in the, the, like, didn't people argue at seminars before and like yell at each other and stuff? I mean, other, no, you, you, you're like the one guy who elicits that kind of response. But for years, like, there was some really good hearted, like, ribbing. It was more than ribbing, you know? And f as a young person, that really inspired me. Like, I really, I like yelling. So that really worked for me. This room is also the place where we would do the student awards. I mean, we would do the, the departmental intros every September, and we did the student awards at the end of the year. I often got to present the uh, TA of the Year Award, which was, which was always, you know, an honor for me to do. Like so many TAs of the Year or whatever were in my program, and there's some of them here today, and it's, it's just, there's just a lot of memories there. I even had, like, you remember this? You don't? Come on, dude. So, like, so Bob, Bob Whalen is not a member of our department. He's a member of the English department. And his last semester, right, you, you drew this room to lecture in. And, like, his last day, I'm thinking, we've got to do something. So, like, I, do you remember that? I printed up, like, a, a little thing with like pictures of him and brought this and it was a full bottle then you know but this was the absolute this was the actual deal that we we had like a toast at the in the front of the room on your last day here so there's been a lot of a lot of stuff even like my my daughter right I taught summer school here for 15 years you took it remember with her her boyfriend to become husband will and am I remembering this right? But for those five weeks, wasn't he going out with like another girl? <laughs> oh, wait, now, and wasn't she? Class, right, right. <laughs> and she was also in the class. So at least I'm remembering that right. That was a little awkward. But anyway, so uh, just to like make me comfortable, like I'm gonna just do something that I would always do. Like it was the second or third lecture. The lecture was on water, like properties of water. So like, yeah, we're biology. And, and see how old school this is? Like when I was lecturing in this room, there was no PowerPoint. Like, I, I don't know if you saw my announcement, but like there was no like internet. There was no like texting, there were no cell phones, like people like, yeah, it's hard to imagine. But this is, this is how it started. And um, is Len here? Like you really, like he had the most, you had the best overheads. Don't, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm just telling you, like I copied a lot of your stuff. But yeah, but it was really good. Like, with, like for low tech, like you killed it. And, and I like, I copied it. And that's the thing with teaching. Like, 
Like you're supposed to be observed and critiqued. Nobody ever does that, right? Like they come for like nine minutes, like, and it's fine. I mean, unless you're getting complaints. So like you could copy others and that's part of the deal. <laughs> and they would, they have no idea you're doing it. Anyway, okay. So, so water. So I would go through like the properties just to make it seem, to, just to make the magic seem, the magic trick seem legit. I'd go, so, so here's H2O, water molecule, like the oxygen has eight protons, the, the hydrogens only have one, so, so the electron wants to spend more time over there. So, so water is a dipole, it's charged on both ends. That's why it's the universal solvent. You know, you could dissolve your sugar in your coffee or your rock salt on your, your driveway in water. So anyway, you don't care about all that. And, and even <laughs> frozen water is also really interesting. Like it, it, it allows life on Earth to exist. Like if you think about it, most other substances as a solid are heavier than the liquid form. So they would, so ice would sink, but it happens to be lighter so it floats. So if ice sunk, like Moosehead Lake, you know, every three feet at a time would get filled up and then it would just be solid ice and dead. So the fact that, uh, the fact that, um, anyway, but that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, I was trying to, I'm, I'm, I was trying to get to the magic trick. And if, if other people want to use this, this is, this is, this was a killer trick that I did every time, most every time. So there's always somebody like in the audience that, that has, a bottle of water and I would say, so, so I would start talking about like the human mind now. And they were used to me like being this way. So it was like, it was like, you know, but like mind over matter, you know, like we don't really understand the human mind. It's like the next frontier, you know, like you've heard about people who could like bend nails with their mind and all that sort of thing. I would say like I could turn liquid water into solid water just with my thoughts but I'm gonna need all of you to like join in and help me. Legit, like I would do this and then I would borrow some water and I would take my coffee cup and I would pour the water into the cup and then I would just do weird things. I would like stand in front and like start like shivering and, <laughs> and like be like, all right, like think, think cold thoughts and then it would be like, no, more, more and then, I don't know. Like it, 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 and then I would like tap like my magic cup I hope this works, Zoe. And then I would like turn it upside down. <sighs> All right. <laughs> Here's the thing. <laughs> like I had, I had too much water in the sponge already. <laughs> but you get the idea, right? Ice, ice would fall out, and it would, it worked. It worked a lot better. It worked a lot better when I was actually lecturing. But anyway, so let's see. What where do we go after that? And aside from this room, like most of my life was spent where the beer is going to be, like on the other side of the building, in the four lab rooms. So we're going to talk a lot about lab and all that. But that was another big place I spent time and I also spent time in the uh, in DPC in the lecture hall so I'll just set I'll, I'll share a few stories about about that so I was lecturing in the fall of 2004 and didn't you say you were in the class then so I mean that makes me feel good but a little old there you know but <laughs> So during 04, I'm lecturing, Julia's in the class, and who remembers what was happening during the fall of 04? Socks. Right, the Sox were making their historic run to their first world championship since 1918. So every lecture during October, I would lead it off with like highlights from the Red Sox game and you know, downloaded stuff. And I thought everyone really liked it. <laughs> until I got my teaching evaluations and then, <laughs> yeah, it was, it wasn't always as, uh, as liked as I want. Yeah, I was going to, so I would, I would often, and see there's the Hawaiian shirts, that's what I used to wear. <laughs> I would be going through like the whole like socks run to the championship every, every time. And we happened to have Joe Seggio in the class as a TA who was from Brooklyn and his family had season tickets at Yankee Stadium. 
So that was a, you know, a blessing for me because, so we made this bet. And it was, and I won't talk baseball, but that was the who's your daddy season with Pedro and saying like the Yankees are his daddy. So we made a bet, like if the Yankees win, then I will wear Yankees gear on the, the next lecture and, and he'll come down and I'll say like the Yankees are my daddy and vice versa. <laughs> So, much to his credit, like, as we all know, the Sox won, and, and there's lectures at 9, 11, and 1, and he showed up at all three lectures and went through that torture of, like, putting on the Sox hat and saying he's my daddy and all this crap. It was amazing. So, I, I yeah, anyway. So, that's the good, that's the good story. There's many, many bad stories and there's 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 like like just right in one row there's like all these former chairs and things that like you guys that probably didn't know any of this crap so like <laughs> right there's there were, like and I don't have time to go through the close calls but but this one this one really is pretty classic so so like I said I taught at 9 11 and 1 and literally the wife of the university president taught at eight, Mary Rumpfo. So she's teaching chemistry at eight, I'm coming behind her to teach bio at nine. And the place had a great sound system, it did. And it's like college students don't wake up until noon, so you know, I would come in and like play music loud and they would like it and I would like it and, and Mir me and Mary would, you know, we would like politely pass at the podium and whatever and chat a little bit, but whatever. So, so then one day I saw this movie, Eight Mile, great movie. Jerry's from Motown, right? Like, I mean, you know where Eight Mile Road is? So, so, but here's the part of it. See, there's this little part here. <laughs> so, and it was before, it was before Spotify and, and legal downloading. And Ty was what, like 12 or something? So I would just come up with songs that I wanted and he would like illegally rip them from Napster or something. <laughs> give them to me on a CD and I wouldn't listen to them. I would just like throw the CD in and press play, turn it up to eight and we're good. <laughs> so that day, like we played, we played, I call it one shot. What's the really, what's the real name of that? That movie, that Lose Yourself, the, the theme song from that, from that, uh, from that movie. And I mean, it was not a good situation. <laughs> Like it's, it's turned way up, like all the students are used to all this music and then there's just lots of like words that began with like M and F and like it was bad, you know? And so, but then it's really awkward when it goes from like ba -ba -ba boom to like quiet, boom. And that's what I had to do because I'm standing next to the wife of the university president and it's just, it's just not good, like you're different, you know? But like I just wasn't sure. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway, so all right. So so truly, like I don't know. I just assumed like my career like it clipped along like that for like 20 years, and I worked with everyone in the department. Ben Lyle, I can't name them all, but Ben Lyles, Len Cass, Doug Gelina, Sue Hunter, Ellie, Jody, Dusty, Malcolm, Chris Campbell, Chris Cronin, Susan Brawley, Ian Davidson, John Jepkema, Krista, like everybody. And it was wonderful. Like I, I mean, I don't know it was wonderful for them, but it was wonderful <laughs> for me. I liked it, you know, and I enjoyed like developing labs and writing manuals and prep guides and training TAs and, you know, comforting, crying nursing majors, like all of that stuff. <laughs> so when you tell people like, ah, you did the same job for 30 years, like the same class, like wasn't that boring? No, it really, I said that I was guiding once, but to, like I had a brain surgeon in the boat. I'm like, doesn't it get the same? Like, you know, one brain, you know, and the guy just looks at me. <laughs> and it's sort of that way, honestly. Like it, I never was, I never felt bored. And I really thought like, all right, I'll coast along like this for another 15 years and I'll reach this point, which is right now and just retire, call it good. But then, bang, what happened? Inquiry-based biology, which is a completely new approach to teaching biology that was being developed for over a year 
and then Mary came down and presented the idea to me. I'm going to show you Mary. This is like my favorite picture. I mean, there's lots of pictures of Mary, but that's Mary. <laughs> like, like, it just shows like how close people get to like, you know, it really is like a family kind of, that's Nikki Adams next to her. I'll talk to talk about Nikki during the, the graduate student thing. But anyway, so in that initial meeting, like, I mean, these aren't quotes, but it's pretty close. It's like, we want to get away from the idea that teachers will be the keepers of the information. So from now on, there won't be really any right or wrong answers in lab anymore. And, and we won't use performance-based testing to assign grades. And Farad now will be coordinate, coordinating Bio 100 and 200 and doing all the lecturing. So your role will be limited exclusively to the lab. I mean, yikes, right? Like for a guy who like literally lets his clothes hang in the closet, right? Kristen's nodding her head. For two years before I, I even think of putting them on because I don't like change. Like <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of change for me. But I would say, you know, I'm a pretty good team player and it didn't take me long at all to get on board with the direction that things were heading. One thing I asked though was because I'd been doing this for 20 years, I, I, I wanted to, you know, maybe have an opportunity to like incorporate some of the information from like the manuals and prep guides and curriculum development and stuff that I've done, you know, those previous 20 years like into the into the new curriculum. So I wrote like in my mind what I thought was like a famous like manifesto. I would write a manifesto how often? Like once every two or three years. <laughs> they were great. I mean I really enjoyed them. I mean nobody else did but this manifesto had 11 bullet points of like absolute like essential things from all this knowledge that needed to be carried over to this new thing we're doing. And Ryan like was a recipient of that manifesto so like, how many bullet points did we follow? Uh, <laughs> Wait, I don't think people heard that. How many? Uh, Kevin, we didn't follow any of the <laughs> Right. They didn't follow a single one of my bullet points. And basically, that's how my career as an inquiry-based biology instructor began. So to people from outside the group, like, I, I know, like, that sounds, that, that sounds harsh. And I'm not going to lie, like, for the first week or two, like, I wasn't totally stoked about, like, throwing all that out, like, completely, zero, like, and starting completely, completely fresh. But in my heart, I knew that any time an individual or group tries to do something that's truly different and revolutionary, they get resistance and collateral damage always has to occur. Like, I, I feel like, I mean, I may, I may seem, well, maybe I won't seem young, but I, I really feel like I came of age like in the 60s when lots of change was happening. Like the, the women's movement was, was huge back then. The civil rights movement was in full, in full swing. My house was across the Passaic River from Newark. So I had a front row seat for everything that was going on in those days. And that's when I learned that, you know, if you're trying to do something big and important and new and different like civil rights, you're going to have to take some hits. It's not, it's not always easy. Nowadays, we're facing the same sort of thing, right? We have a climate crisis. We need to get away from fossil fuels to ensure our planet's future. If we do that, people in the oil and gas industry are going to lose their jobs. And, you know, refinery cities like Houston and Galveston will suffer. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do new things and, and change for the better. But, you know, sometimes it comes with a price. Now, I know Bio 100 is on a much smaller scale than that. But if we carried over, like, you know, if we did a blended thing like I was thinking and carried over my old school principles from traditional bio, they would have diluted out and masked the full potential of inquiry-based teaching and not given Mary and Ryan's ideas and vision a chance to fully blossom. So handling things the way they did really was the only viable option if they wanted inquiry bio to be a success. 
And I've always really respected them for doing it that way. And soon after we, we rolled out Inquiry Bio on a trial basis, it became obvious, really, that teaching in this fashion was a great idea and it was going to be a great success. And whenever Mary and Ryan talked about Inquiry Bio, <laughs> they, <laughs> they always included me under their umbrella and acted like I was one of the founders of the thing. Like, I don't even remember what that was. But it was like some campaign button, and she made me the president and her the vice president. Like, I mean, that was very generous. But it just wasn't, I'm just saying, it wasn't true. Like, Farad, like, let the cat out of the bag. Like, it wasn't like, yeah, like, Kevin's, like, thinking it up, dreaming this up. Like, so I, I was a good, like, contributor. I feel like, like, you know, we all, like me, Farad, like many of the TAs in the room, like played an important role in, in getting where we are now. But the original concept and idea and the original writing of the lab manuals and prep guides all came from them. Anyway, okay, so how exactly does Inquiry Bio teaching work in a college lab? In a nutshell, we try to make students responsible for their own learning. So at the start of each lab period, we literally roll dice and select a random table of students to come down front and give the opening lecture. Not the teacher, the students. And depending on how well they do and how clear things are, that's what they, that's what they get graded on. We also have students do self-evaluations, peer evaluations, and prevent their findings to each other just like real scientists do. So the crux of what we really try to do is get people curious and excited about science and develop their own ideas and hypotheses on how the world works. Early on, I, I coined a phrase called biological mechanisms. And all the TAs in the audience know how much grading weight we, we place on this because this is really what we're going for. Like, we don't want to really know what's going on. We want to know how it's happening and why it's happening. So let me just, I think it will be easier if I, and this may get, and this is, this will be it. Like the next little bit of like technical and then we'll get back to like fooling around. But <laughs> you got to have like some sort of hardcore part. And I know you can't read that. So, so I'm going to just, this is, a, this is a grading rubric. So how do, we, how do we assign grades without testing and all that stuff I said we're not doing anymore without having it be unfair and random? Well, we've, we developed these things called rubrics and across the top, you can't really read it, but it has nice soft words like okay, good, needs improvement, but really what it says is A, B, C, D, F. <laughs> like that's what it is. That's how it is. <laughs> and, and this is a lab report, so there's all these. So there are, there are categories of lab, you know, the intro, the methods, the blah, 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 blah. And, and the, thing, the, the, the true thing about Inquiry Bio, it was very transparent. Like there was no, like, it was hard for the TAs and the students to get sometimes, but it wasn't because we weren't telling them. Like it was, I would carry this rubric around in my pocket all the time. And I would ask students all the time, what, like Foley, what do you want to get in this lab? What grade? And you would say an A. And I would be like, okay, to get an A, you have to do everything in this column. So let's look at the next thing. This is a companion sheet. So the lab manual opens like this. There's two pages. On, on the right page is the grading rubric. On the left page, is the proficiency levels. And I know there's a lot of little words and I'm gonna break this down for you, but all these little detailed words tell Foley how he's gonna get an A. If you want an A, then do everything it says in the excellent column and you'll get an A. Like if you want a C, then do everything in the okay column. It's really that simple. So there's no like secrets, or, but you know, a lot of things sound simple. So let's look, at, let's look at a couple of examples that you can actually see. Can you, can you read that more or less? Yeah. Okay. So what I've done from the lab report is I've taken the introduction section, right? And this is the top part is from the grading part and the other part is from the proficiency part. So let's look at 
So there's, within the introduction, the TAs would be asked to look at three different concepts. Let's just look at one here. Uh, does the hypothesis have a prediction and reasoning? And then in the, in the proficiency section, it, it goes on with, with bullets to tell you that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you that in the next, the next panel. But note, see, there's three lines here, and there's three bulleted lines here. It all makes sense, really. It just... You just need to be trained to understand what you're looking for. So, the hypothesis, does it have a prediction and reasoning? So, and this, this just tells you if you want a, an F, a C, or an A. I'll just give you a simplified example. So, a predictive hypothesis would be Santa will come down the chimney on Christmas Eve, right? So, so there's a prediction there, but there's no reasoning. So if you wanted like, to get full credit for that hypothesis, you'd say, Santa will come down the chimney on Christmas Eve because, because, fill in the blank, he loves all boys and girls, that kind of thing. So you have a prediction and reasoning. If you don't have both, you're not going to get full credit. And, and the, the rubric was just a series of many, 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 many things that the TA would have to go through. Let's look at one more here. So this is under the dis discussion and conclusion. And you see, this is worth 40%. The other was worth 20%. Some are worth 10. So in my little thing that I would carry around all the time, it would be like, Foley, how much time are you spending on the method section? It's only worth 10%. So if you fill up like half your page with something you're only going to get 10% on, you're not doing well, right? So anyway, so Understanding the biological me mechanisms, I, I said, I talked about that earlier. So again, five lines, one, two, three, four, five. So we got five sets of bullets, one, two, three, four, five. So now again, like, this would just give them in very detail what would be an acceptable and okay or an excellent answer for that. And that's what we did over and over and over again for everything we did. This is just the photosynthesis lab report. So we had multiple lab reports, we had intro talks, presentations, peer evaluations, poster sessions, oral defenses, and they all had these sorts of rubrics which with people like many of them sitting here that I'm looking at right now like played a critical role in developing. So it really was like a huge like team effort in, in doing that and, and, and trying to get this like explained to everybody was a big part of my job. The hardest thing for people who aren't really deep into this is to understand we cared about answers, sorry, but not really. It wasn't about getting the right answer. It was more about thinking about the question, investigating things deeply using legit sources and methodology. It's based, and, and I know we're going to run short on time, but I got to just, I'll tell the story very briefly. It's bas basically what we did at our dinner table many days while the kids were growing up. Like I would come home and like talk about like all this random crap that like probably went like way over their head most of the time. So there was this one time like I was all fired up. I came home, I was talking about like the importance of green plants in producing oxygen. Like it's like, you know, like before there were plants, there was no oxygen on the planet and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they're all like glazed over and whatever. But anyway, then like two weeks later, it's like Thanksgiving and ties like in first grade or something. And, and so the theme for the parent, parental visitation is like, what are we thankful for? So, so like, you know, me and Cheryl are in there and there's all these little things tacked up like I'm thankful for like my puppy and I'm thankful for like Meemaw's camp on like Coldstream Pond. And, and Petrie and Lori, who like, we didn't really know them then. They, you know, they're our best friends now, but like then like we were new to town and whatever. So, and Lori, you know, like she, her voice is sort of loud sometimes, you know, and she's like right next to me and Cheryl. And we're like, you know, the parents are going along, look, reading all these things, and they're right behind us. And they get to Ty's thing. And Lori's like, Stephen, what the hell is this? Somebody's thankful for oxygen? <laughs> and, and, and he said, he, he said, shh, he said, shh, it's probably just one of those university kids. <laughs> I was, on, I was on the phone with a client on Wednesday, two days ago. Yep. I told that story. No shit. <laughs>
but we did that. Like, that's what we did. And that really is kind of like what inquiry-based bio is, basically. So, oh, wait, I had a picture to go with that, see? All right. So, so for me, what's the, the most challenging thing about doing this, running a large program our, in our department, inquiry-based, is that most high schools and colleges don't teach in an inquiry-based style. So all of our new Bio 100 and 200 TAs need to be indoctrinated and trained in, in, in inquiry-based methods every semester, mostly in real time. So they show up like the Friday before classes start, we have a kickoff meeting and then, okay, and then there we go. And we utilize around 30 TAs to teach 1,200 students in 80 lab sections every year. So it's, it's, a, big, it's a big operation. And the point is, we don't have known outcomes. When we taught traditionally, there was a prep guide, and you do the enzyme lab, and here are the answers. In inquiry-based, it's nothing like that. There are no right or wrong answers. So the TAs have to be able to ad lib and think on their feet, and so that's why it's essential to have somebody like me in the labs, like helping that, helping train them in real time in front of the in front of the class, which is is what I did. So, <laughs> and, no, the most effective way to do it is go into the classes and, and ask individual questions to students. And like a new TA, like, they don't know what level of questions to ask and they're afraid to really be insulting. But like, this is college and we're not being insulting, we're just being real. So I would go in and like, ask a lot of hard questions and I would do that week after week after week. You can't just have like a, a lab meeting, an hour lab meeting on Monday with a bunch of new people who have no idea what's going on and expect it to work. Like, they'll get to the end, but will people learn anything and will it be, no. So, so that's why we did it <clears throat> the way we did it. And in time, I would see like the TAs begin to like mimic my behavior and get comfortable like pushing some students for more information and other times letting a class discussion go for a while even though you know like, yeah, they don't have any idea what they're talking about. <laughs> but if you let it go long, if you just cut them right off, then they're not thinking then you're the keeper of the information. If you let it go, and that's why it's hard, like how long do you let it go before it's like, yeah, you're never gonna get there. So, <laughs> so there, there, was, there was a lot, of, a lot of that stuff. So the danger is, it, is if you don't have somebody on the scene to demonstrate to the TAs what we're shooting for and to maintain continuity, I mean, the quality of the performance is just going to sink to the lowest common denominator. It's not going to rise to its full potential. And I think it's important for administrators and people who are in, in control of the budget to understand how critical that is to have a person in the labs every day to the future success and growth of the program. Like, it's not, an, I mean, we say, like, we're the leaders in inquiry-based teaching. It's not enough to just say that. We need to back it up with resources and support because that's what it takes to really implement it in, real, in, in, in the field. Because here's the thing, like new grad students don't automatically come on campus with any knowledge on how to teach. I mean, they don't know the right questions to ask to get the best performance out of their class or how to lead an effective class discussion or a million other little tricks of the teaching trade. They need to be shown and they need to be shown multiple times. This is an interesting fact. It took me literally, when I switched to inquiry, I taught like inquiry lab sections just to sort of get used to it and, and so then I could do a better job training people. It took me three years of teaching my own sections to get totally comfortable with what we're shooting for and how to get the main points across. And that was after already teaching in the classroom for 20 years. So how could we expect new grad students to run successful labs without providing like a lot of support. And the reality, and this is no shocker, like grad students are all like on a very tight time schedule. Like what's their main task? It's not to teach Bio 100, it's to do well in their own classes and do well in their own research. I mean, we try to like sugarcoat it, and, but the reality, that's, that's the reality. So, so there's always that temptation for people to cut corners. And I used to call that the everybody wins scenario. 
and this is what it looks like. You're an easy grader. If you're an easy, you saw that rubric. That's one rubric of like a book full of them. If you're an easy grader, you're going to give everybody an A or B anyway. You really don't have to like get into it that deeply, right? You're not going to write as many comments. You're not going to be as thorough. <clears throat> and, and the same thing with the intro talks, with the poster sessions, with anything. Like if you're easy, no one's going to complain. So you're not going to have like people like yelling at you and wanting to schedule meetings outside of class. They're just going to be happy. So you won't get any complaints and they'll get good grades. So everybody wins, right? Except the TAs who like aren't doing that because they're the ones who their students complain to them because their roommate is getting a different experience than, than they are. And the experience we're really going for is, 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 is the one that everyone's getting yelled at about. And the students lose because they aren't learning as much or getting what they, what they paid for. I'm going to do a Bernie Sanders thing right here. I learned this from Bernie. But I want to be perfectly clear here. You know how he does that? <laughs> I want to be perfectly clear here. I'm not trying to single out individual TAs for cutting corners. Just the opposite. Oh, darn. This is, this is one stack of papers. This is like one week of great. It's like four and a half inches. So what I am pointing out are the very real pressures that TAs are under and the need they have for top-notch support to help them do this job that we say is essential and it is, and difficult, so we need to support them. Okay, so we're getting there. Uh, I've heard several first-hand stories recently from high school teachers who were told by their principal or department head to give a student a grade that's higher than they deserve, simply to stop their parent from calling the office every day. Or their, that student complaining to them every day. It's easy to recognize that this is wrong, right? But what about sending TAs into a classroom without adequate training or mentoring or supervision? Like my experience is that as TAs get a better understanding of how inquiry-based teaching works, they gain confidence in their ability to grade more rigorously. TAs who aren't certain of what we're getting at don't really feel qualified to apply the grading rubrics as they were intended. And that's understandable. So in the end, the grades from those student sections get inflated. Maybe not on purpose, but they get inflated just like the high school example that I listed. Okay, so just a couple of take home messages because I know I talked about a lot of different things. And then we'll get to a couple of Thank yous and acknowledgements, and then we'll go out and have the beer. So the first take-home message, and yeah, you'll see. I've, I've learned all my take-home messages from either television or sports, which I don't know what that says about me. And this one is both. So, so as a young kid, I remember this. Like, this is Daryl Royal, the, the, the coach of the Texas Longhorns. And he was, he was near his end, the end of his career. He's being interviewed by like this young reporter. And it's like, coach, like, what is it about your, you know, that, that, that is so good? Like, is it the new wishbone offense that you put in or the, the, the defensive schemes that you're, you're, you're coming up with every week? Like, what makes you so successful? I can't do a good Southern accent, but he said, son, it's not about the X's and the O's. It's about the Jimmy's and the Joe's. And really, like, that really stuck with me. Like, it's, it's true. Like, that really is, in my mind, what it's all about. Like, at heart, Coach Royal was a people person. And they understood that in order for him to be successful, he needed to get the most out of every other member of his team. I could start talking, like, football now, and, like, I won't. But, like, <laughs> let's look at the Dallas Cowboys right now. Anyway, okay. So... So he made the effort and he took the time to connect with all of his players. So they like buy in and, and develop a liking for him. And, and then in turn, he got more out of them by, by being nice to him 
it wasn't, it wasn't the plays that he drew up or the defensive schemes. It was being a people person. And I think that translates directly to just about every walk in life. No one accomplishes big things by themselves. Look at our government right now. Getting people to buy in and promote your ideas, the best way to do that is to befriend them and listen to them and develop a rapport and a connection with them and have trust. And then eventually, things will work themselves out. Okay, the second point um, is about standards and hard work, and I have a few props here. So I'm gonna give Ty this, this, this is a, I didn't steal it, I had, this is an authorized, I borrowed this from Mahaney Diamond, this is like a practice home plate. I'm gonna have Ty measure the width of this home plate. <laughs> How wide is that plate, son? Go 17 inches. 17 inches it is. Good job. Like a real plate has a little black border around it, as you know, right, Thibodeau? If you're throwing it on the black, you're right, you know, that one. But work with me. 17 inches. Okay? So Petrie's here. Won the, the, the City Little League Championship like six times in a row. We're stretching it, but it sounds good. So how, how wide was the plate at the KSC Hall? 17, 17 inches. And Thibodeau's a big Yankee fan. It, how about the plate at Yankee Stadium? How wide is that? 17 inches. And how wide was it when Babe Ruth played? 17 inches. Right. And what happens to a Yankee player who can't throw the ball over that plate? Well, I'd say probably either get set down in the minors or traded to the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> Thibodeau. I should have seen that. I should have seen that one coming, huh? Right. They get sent down, they get sent down to Scranton. They don't widen the plate to 18 inches or 19 inches or 20 inches just because somebody can't throw the ball over there, and they shouldn't. And that's what standards are. There are lots of things in life that I would have liked to have done, like play third for the Red Sox, but I wasn't good enough. I got cut from every basketball team I ever tried out for. I avoided classes in college that had lots of numbers in math because I wasn't smart enough to pass them. That's not a knock on me. I'm just a victim of my genetics and environment. But if we're true believers in natural selection, then why shouldn't it be applied to academics as well as the living world? In truth, some people just have more aptitude in some areas than others. It's easy to recognize this in sports because you can see that some people run faster and jump higher. But it's, it's totally, it's no different in academia. Here's the thing though. Some people are overachievers. And that's where the milk of human kindness comes into play. And that's where it gets, it gets difficult because you, you want to give people a chance, like not just have it be like that cold, but you have to be fair to the others in the class. And, and we would, me and Ryan had like many like spirited debates about these sorts of things for, for years. And, and so, that, that line between sending the person down to Scranton and, and giving them a chance is where it gets difficult. So, so I want to use two examples. The first, oh, darn it. All right, well, just don't look at Nicole yet. So, so the first example is Larry Bird, right? Like, he was slow. He couldn't jump six inches off the ground. Yet he's in the NBA Hall of Fame. So if people didn't give him a chance, you know, he would never have a chance. So he had a positive attitude, you know, he, he worked hard, he never quit. Hey, Lori. So, and she's walking in, right? You ready for this? Okay. The other person, Nicole Garrity, it took her three tries to get a C in Bio 100. But through incredibly hard work and determination, she's now a successful veterinarian. So people like this, who work incredibly hard, should be rewarded. And I think it's a disservice to them, though, 
if we just water down standards across the board. So that's, that's the tricky part. And finally, just to broaden this out a little bit, I think, I think the university should lead more by example than we do. We're the land-grant institution in the great state of Maine. And I really think, like, citizens look to us for leadership. I'm going to try not to hit the button as hard. So, when I walk into Murray Hall every day and see the gigantic new, like, alternative energy building next door with a perfect, huge, south-facing exposure and see a gas line running into it instead of having it be covered in solar panels, like, that just kills me. I mean, thousands of people come to the Collins Center on campus who aren't from here every year. If they saw that, like, we would be, we would be leaders. We would be providing them with a great showcase example for, for what things could be. But we have an alternative energy building with a gas line instead of solar panels. Like, that, that I don't like that. And even if it only convince one person to think about their carbon footprint and, and make some changes in their life, it would be worth it. But I get it. Everyone's busy and it's easier to just go with the flow than stand up and say something. Like my biggest regret in my 33 year career here is that I didn't take more action like that, either locally or globally. And I kind of, eh, I feel like my whole generation was guilty of this. Like you get busy raising a family, like earning a living, and some of these sorts of things that, you know, you think about for two minutes on the way, but you know, it, it, they just never make it to the top of the list, so you never do anything about it. But we live in a critical time, and thankfully, there are some young people around that are here to inspire us, like Greta Thunberg. She's an amazing 16-year-old environmental activist from Sweden who's been traveling around the world mostly by non-fossil fueled power means to become a leading voice for climate change activism. Greta. And Malala Yousafzai, you've probably heard of her. She was an 11-year-old who spoke out against the Taliban because they banned girls from going to school in Pakistan. And she got shot in the head by them in retaliation for her activism. But ultimately, she recovered and went on to become the youngest person to ever receive the Nobel Peace Prize at, at 14. And it's not just young people. Like, do you know who this is? Old people, everybody. Like, everybody can be inspirational. I really feel terrible about this. Like, this is the only Democratic presidential candidate that I ever voted against. And like, I just feel terrible because post-president, <laughs> like he has been nothing but like a hero for, for social causes, like he's a big habitat for humanity guy. So, so you can find inspiration in, in many places. And hopefully in retirement, I'll join people like this and, and do stuff to like make the world a better place instead of just thinking about it and talking about it. And hopefully, some of you will be able to join me in that as well. So I know, just one more. So this, one's, this is going to be the hard part. I'm going to try not to look at these pictures because I brought like a whole thing of tissues. I haven't used them yet, so that's good. So like, thank yous. Like if you've been here this long, there's lots of people to acknowledge and thank. So I'm going to do that right now. As you heard from um, the bio that, that Julia read me, like honestly, getting this job at UMaine was probably like one of the two or three happiest days of my life. I mean, by the end of 85, we had like 2.75 kids and had <laughs> moved, we did, like Cheryl's pregnant there. We moved around a lot during the previous five years, and we really wanted to settle down and raise our kids in Maine. So this truly was my, my, my dream job. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I'll talk, I'll just tell you, well, let me go on to the next one and then I'll talk about that. Keep that, remember this sign and I'll come back to it. 
So the first person I'd like to thank is, is Bob Vadas. Like I went to his office several times. I tried to like track him down and have him come, sent him emails. And then the other night we're at like Pat's Pizza and he's like sitting there. I'm like, dude, like I've been trying to work, you know. But he, you know, he has physical therapy today. He couldn't come, you know, but I, I, I told him what I'm telling you today. And I've done that a lot with him. I mean, I really, I mean, when I came here, I had very little college teaching experience. He really like took a chance on me. And you could look this up. I literally got hired 33 years ago today in Deering Hall in a lab room, literally while the departmental Christmas party was going on, <laughs> I swear to God, in the hallway. And I was supposed to start here January 1st. So leading up to being hired, right? Like, I mean, I had a lot of things I needed to do, like get home and move Cheryl and the kids, and I like literally break into a cold sweats just thinking about that little time frame. So as much as you could as a job candidate, like I put, I, I squeezed Bob, like I'm like, I need a decision. And, and to his credit, like he didn't just say, you know, buddy, like hit the road, like he, he, he made things happen for me, and I'll always be grateful for that. <coughs> oh boy. So next, I would like to acknowledge the most unsung group of heroes on campus, my work-study students. Truly, like for over 30 years, this group of undergrads did a wide variety of difficult and dirty tasks, often for very little, very low pay and little recognition, except in my mind, because I loved and appreciated them greatly, and I hope, I know they, I think I, think I know they, they knew it. But most of the work-study students were young, right? You guys were usually under 21, so we never really went out and hung out outside of work. <laughs> but, well, when I get to the grad students, you'll see why I'm saying that. <laughs> but you guys kept me informed on what was going on, you know, on campus, and I gave you lots of, like, often unsolicited life advice. <laughs> so I, I really, I really felt very close to my work-study students. This is Brianna, this is Ashley. So my current work-study students who are sitting right there, and they're, they've been absolute rock stars over the last two and a half years. And basically covered my ass while I've been on this half-time phase retirement. Like without you guys, I couldn't have done a phase retirement. So I'll always truly be in your debt for, for, for doing all that you have done for me. Right before, I can't look at these because it's just gonna get crazy. Like right before Ashley and Brianna, like Zoe. And, you know. I don't know, like these people, I don't know where they get it from, but. <sighs> you were like the most independent, self-confident without being cocky type person who was like politically involved like I always used to tell you like you're just what did I used to tell you you're old beyond your years <sighs> yeah this is not going to go well <laughs> anyway <laughs> the other thing is it was it's always nice when people people who you haven't seen for a while come by and visit. So this, this semester, like these guys came by, Dominique and Emily came by and visited Amber's there. They were, you know, these people were th with me through really difficult times. Those guys, you know, like, you know those difficult times. And they were there 
they were actually that picture, and I wasn't using university funds to pay for this, but <laughs> they, they were they were actually helping me like split and stack my wood for the for the fall that that first winter when when no one else was around. So I'll I'll always be thankful for all the, to all the work studies. They were just amazing. <laughs> The one, and then boy, if I, can, if I could get through this one, but the, the work study story that probably pulls at my heartstrings the most happened a few years ago when a former student contacted me, you know, at the first, just to say hi and give me an update on how things were going in his life. You know, he had a great job he'd been working at for 10 years, like, and was contemplating making some changes. So he called me? <laughs> like, and so... He said he remembered all our talks and the things I, you know, would tell him during our two years together. And then literally, like, he took out his wallet and reached out and, like, pulled out this piece of paper that I, like, wrote some, like, life advice on, like, ten years ago that he'd been, like, carrying around for, like, ten years. I mean, I, I was just completely blown away, like... You know, I, you know, you all know, I talk so much. Like, I really, I never really know if people are, like, really listening, you know. They probably, like, right, you listen, but there's a, there's a limit to listening, right? And, but, but I guess people, people do listen. So that was, that was life-changing for me. Anyway, so the final group of people I would like to acknowledge are the people who have made, like, you know, my life here so great over all these years, and that's the TAs and the grad students. Because I've been here so long, it's hard. My memory kind of divides people into different groups and chapters with their own distinctive flavors and things, so I'm going to take a crack at this. Like in the early years, like my kids were young, and we would, did like a lot of like outdoor activities, like serious like fishing trips to like Allagash Lake at Ice Out and, and up north and, and whatever. And we also played a ton, uh, let's see, yeah. I, yeah, Tom Moylan, uh, these are a little out of, I wanted to show you that one. We also played a ton of ice hockey. Like it just happened to be like everyone was just interested in hockey. And so for like this, this magical bubble of time, like I don't know how long was it, Hannah? Five years maybe? Like, but it was co-ed, it was like no checking, no equipment. It was just, it was incredible. Like it, it, it was so good, you know. And, and I hate to name names, but people like Tom and Nikki, the guy that, that was on the previous slide, like Eric and Ashley, Hannah and Greg, like all those people, you know, I'll never, never forget like all those times that I had with, with them. And then this guy came on the scene, Mike Kinnison. And so like all my memories, I think, from the, the middle stages of my career, not all of them, but many of them were dominated by your grad students, like Nate and Wendy and Bailey and Dylan, and then there's like Jordan Coxie, Chris Loggy, Jason Johnston, Katie Degouche, all these people. But I mean, it's just too much, you know, like Wendy, this is Wendy, we did like multiple like fishing trips together and like Dylan like he would never pose with a fish smaller than five pounds you know that's <laughs> it's always difficult it's like wow that's a good one he's like ah no that's a little one I'm like dude like let, he's like no anyway like Dylan he was married to Coxie I mean it was it was a really great time this is this is Nate like Nate Nate has taught us all way more about Kansas than we ever thought existed, right? Like Kansas, it's like a very, but like he knew everything about like the sports teams and the culture and like, you know, I learned how to cook like barbecue Kansas City style. And he said, well, come over and I'll, I'll teach you. I'm like, great. Like we were doing like a Super Bowl party on Sunday. He's like, come over on Thursday. I'm like, why? He's like, we're going to start. It was <laughs> like rubbing the meat and like doing, anyway, like <laughs> Nate was, Nate was amazing. And then, like, just some incredible parties. Like, this was, like, the Halloween party. Like, Deb Perkins was, like, Janis Joplin. Like, I mean, <laughs> it was, yeah. It was really, really a lot of fun. I even took a scuba class with Ty and, and Wendy and Coxie during that era. And then, like, when that whole group, like, sort of got done, 
I don't know, like I thought to myself, you know, well, you know, I'm like getting a little older, like maybe my great run of like having fun with the grad students is over, you know, and then like a new generation, like Cassidy starts coming by and like giving me like pictures of fish and like Rachel's like living in my house and like, <laughs> so it just, you know, it just continued really. Um, you know, Kate Warner, Sleepy, Beth Whitmore, the person that I showed getting the award, T Money, Troy, Krista Slemons, like it was, it was another great run of, of people. But the thing is, and this was kind of like, this started out as an academic thing. I, I can't remember how the dream team got together. I think like Mary like might have like suggested like why don't we assemble and so we just got like this group of people like assigned to me and we just we just were like peas and carrots basically so I literally had a binder titled dream team and I would put like all the stuff they did in this binder and it was these these people I hope I you know like like dog Alyssa Adrian JD I had a great picture of JD that like I should show because he's not here but like <laughs> I just can't do it anyway <laughs> if you twist my arm later you know but along with being fun like these guys were incredibly fun they also were with me during some really tough times and you know academically their contributions to inquiry based biology was was incredible so I will I will always remember them. So two more minutes, two more minutes. I just want to talk briefly about a couple things that sort of define me a little bit. So I'll, I'll like right here at the end let you know what the method behind the madness was. The first was nicknames, right? Like I love to give people nicknames. And lots of very special people like Beersy and T-Money, Sleepy, Rhino, Dog, Deuce, JD, K-Mac, V-Mac, KP, Coxie, and Shooter, along with a thousand other people had nicknames. And lots of other people didn't though. And like people wondered why, and I never really knew either. Like there wasn't really a rhyme or reason to the nicknames. Sometimes the name would just pop into my head and I would just go with it. Like Sleepy's a great example. On the first, <laughs> right? On the first day of TA training in like 2013, like Ben Seliger like shows up like 10 minutes late. All right, so if you show up 10 minutes late at the first meeting, you're going to be called sleepy for the rest of your career. <laughs> That's just how it is. And one of my favorite moments each semester is when the, the TA would send me an email and sign it, not with their real name, but with the nickname that I gave them. <laughs> like then, really, like I, I really felt happy about that. And during the last 10 years or so, we always had like an epic Christmas party, which a lot of these people have... Uh, have been to and can attest to in Pat's, in the basement of Pat's after the final exam. We did things like choose the winner of the book selling contest. Okay, we won't, well, we won't. <laughs> and I got to like give a speech and acknowledge some of, the, some of the people and I would always give little awards. So this was like a guy named Austin who was moving to Austin so like I bought him like a Keep Austin Weird shirt. <laughs> And then when, when Rhino was getting done, I got him like a signed Michigan banner and, and we really, really had, had lots of fun doing that. And some years though, when I got busy, I wasn't quite prepared with the awards. So when Sleepy was graduating, the obvious thing to get him was an alarm clock. <laughs> so the one I gave him though, was like a little scratched and it was like a plastic piece missing on the bottom. And when he opened it, literally, he's like, dude, is this your alarm clock? <laughs> and I'm like, ah, yeah. You know. But he kept it, so whatever. Um, and finally, like, just a couple of staff thank yous. Like, everybody knows, like, Ryan's one of my best friends and plays, like, an essential role in everything I do that's worthwhile and creative. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, you know, to Ryan. I'd also like to thank Kelly. Kelly has, over the years, you know, provided like infinite like help and technical support with all of my crazy projects. So, so thank you to Kelly, and then Seth and and Ron and I mean the Bio New Media Lab like Ben and Heather like there's just a, a whole lineup of people in the Bio Media Lab that uh, that have been a constant help to me. So.
So one more paragraph. So with that, like everybody knows, who knows me knows that I'm a sports guy. And the dream of every sports guy is to go out on top. But most people don't have that chance. They either get injured or hang on too long or just never make it onto a winning team. I've had this piece of paper hanging in clear view of where I sit in my office for the past 15 years. It lists all the members of the bio department who passed away while still working here. None of these people ever made it to retirement. And then six years ago, I added the dedication page from the front of the bio manual to that wall, which is Cheryl, of course. I'm not trying to be like morbid or negative here at the end, but just real. There are literally more seats in Fenway Park, which is the smallest park in the majors, than days in your life. So don't waste them. That's why I'm retiring early. But while I was here, I, I truly loved my job and I had a chance to spend my entire career surrounded by smart, motivated people that I liked. So that, along with having you all here today, represents going out on top for me. So thank you, I'll be ever, forever grateful.